Oh, hello, good morning. Uh, let's let me check the questions for now. Um, so welcome to uh, lecture number five uh, already. So um, as you know, hopefully, I, um, uh, for a suggestion uh, by you, I, um, I put the uh, remainder of past lecture online um, or for you to view so we can start again afresh uh, with uh, the actual beginning of a lecture uh, now. So uh, I can start uh, all over again and hopefully finish on time and then uh, do not and then try to catch up next week. Although I'll try to can be on time this time. Um, so this week we'll talk about um, organization strategy and the role of technology and innovation in organization strategy. But first, let me check the questions. Would you please upload the slides this week? Hen and I already done that. One moment. Lecture, lecture five, strategy. Here, it's here. Um, and also, it's in module. It's then one, two, three, four, five. Oops. Okay, sorry. File. Okay, there it is. It's there now. Sorry, it was only in files. Still, uh, uh, struggling with the compass uh, once in a while, or at least forgetting things. So, uh, regarding the presentation, so yes, indeed. So, this, um, this week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, you have to give you a presentation about the first part of your business plan, so about your innovation and an explanation of why your innovation will be a success. Um, so, the presentation, so there are six presentations within each work group. So, we have 20 minutes per presentation. So, your presentation should be about 10 minutes at most. And then we have uh, some time for discussion. Um, not all group members uh, have to present, um, but they all should be present um, because it's uh, compulsory. Um, so it's okay if only, if only one or maybe two people present and especially because we're doing this online of course via zoom i think it's probably best if only one person presents but you can find it out uh, figure it out for yourselves uh, i'm going to send an email after this lecture an email announcement uh, on black uh, canvas after this lecture uh, in which i ask uh, explain the uh, work groups again and ask for a couple of more things so if all goes well, everyone is able to share the screen uh, in the workbook session, so you can share the PowerPoint or the presentation. Um, but I'm also going to ask you to upload it uh, just in case it doesn't work, so we can uh, share the PowerPoint for you uh, if all else fails. Um, so there's going to be one Zoom link for uh, uh, for every workgroup session uh, with a uh, waiting room in it. So if there. Are I don't think there are two lectures. Oh, yeah, well, there's, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's one Zoom link for every uh, uh, work group session. So, one link only. Um, so, if you want, you can uh, also uh, attend other work group sessions, but you do have to attend your own. But if you're curious about other innovations and other ideas, or just want to, you know, steal ideas um, like we do in real life, uh, then you can also uh, attend other presentations if you want. Um, so but, uh, I give him, I'm going to give a bit more information and announce about the lecture. Um, so I also have the help of two um, uh, assistants who, is, who are going to help me with the work group sessions and take over a few um, because Peter, uh, Peter Bruder is only focusing on this course right now. So he was going to teach the work group sessions in the first instance, but he will not. Um, so that's it. Let's get to the presentation. So. Okay, um, so in the first four meetings of this course, we talked about innovation. And in the second meeting, so the, the, the five, six, and seven, so in the uh, next three meetings, we're gonna talk about aspects of the organization. So we're gonna focus on the business part. Uh, but of course, with a focus on uh, business and technology and innovation. Um, today is the first lecture about strategy. To uh, next week, we do um, uh, structure and culture of an organization. The week after that, we do people in the organization. Um, so we start with strategy. This is 
uh, not really relevant for your first presentation, but it is relevant for the business plan, um, especially so in the uh, next presentation, um, somewhere in November, you have to build your organization around the innovation and there you also have to explain something about the uh, strategy of the organization. So let me uh, yeah let me first do the questions since they all uh, disappear. Uh, two questions about during a lecture. S curves of technology are part of not part uh, specifically of diffusion of innovation theory of uh, Rogers, but they are part of diffusion of innovation in general because they explain um, how an, an innovation develops uh, through time or through effort specifically, and um, and they're a tool to assess the um, well, where an innovation is uh, in time and if an innovation is, is at the beginning and is still fruitful or if it's somewhere at the end and will be taken over perhaps by a new innovation which is the disruption um, so that's an s-curve uh, Moore's law um, is uh, basically an example of a kind of an s-curve um, it doesn't look like an s-curve because it was written at scale um, but it's an example of an S-curve of a uh, specific technology, uh, specifically uh, the uh, uh, speed of a computer. Um, that's all you have to know for now, uh, because in lecture number eight, when we're going to talk about uh, technology specifically, I will again, in a bit more detail, explain Moore's Law. Okay. Business strategy. So, um, last week uh, we talked about the business model and we talked about what exactly is a business model and we explained if you build your business model around your innovation, you think about, um, so we think about, um, okay, we have an invention, but we want to bring the invention to market, so we want to make it an innovation and now, in order to do so, we have to think about, okay, what does this innovation offer to uh, uh, potential customers? So we have to create a value proposition that the customer needs. And we have to create our organization around. So we have to think about economic value, cost and revenue, etc. So that's a business model. So actually a business model looks like a strategy. So a building a business model is a strategy for your innovation in order to make the innovation a success. So strategy and business model are um, fairly aligned, but a strategy of the organization is a bit different. So a strategy of the organization is, of course, organization based. So you can see basically see it as a, a longer term business model for an organization as a whole. Um, and the strategy of an organization says something about okay, who are we as an organization? Part of it is who are we as an organization, uh, but specifically a strategy of an, of an organization says something about the future directions of a company and what a company wants to achieve in the future. Um, usually an organization formulates a specific strategy, so they have vision documents or strategy documents, and uh, they do that like once every five, six years or so. So we in the, as the university, I think we now have a new, uh, plan for the future of the universe to basically the strategy yeah, for the next five years. Um, and an organization formulates these strategies in order to know what they should be doing. So um, should we be doing the same as we're doing currently now? Should we try to do something else? Should we uh, focus on the specific innovations in the market, etc.? Um, so it's about the future directions of an organization. Uh, it's about specific objectives that an organization wants to achieve in a set amount of time. Um, it's about fundamental choices of the organization. Okay, this is what we're going to focus on as an organization, um, which also means that there may be certain things that you will not focus on as an organization. And of course, there has to be a fit between the organization and the strategy. Um, so of course, you can have as a strategy that you want to build product X, but if you only focus on certain, if you currently do only service number Y, then um, there is no fit between the organization and the strategy. 
And of course, some organizations are way more flexible than others. You know, if Tesla wants to build um, a flamethrower, Tesla is going to build a flamethrower because it fits their overall uh, organization. But for other organizations, it's more narrow. So that's a strategy. And basically within a strategy, um, within a strategy, you can create business models for specific innovations that may fit the strategy. Um, so a strategy is basically like a short-term vision indeed of an organization. So um, it's, basically, it's on the next slide. Um, an organization has a mission and a vision. So a mission and a vision of the organization are the core things that an organization does. So it's, it's what an organization focuses on now and in the foreseeable or non-foreseeable future. And a strategy is like a vision, but more short terms, short term, and with specific goals and objectives in mind. So I think that's my also a good definition. So a strategy is like a vision, but then with a specific end term with specific goals and objectives. Um, so now let me answer the question quickly. I have a question about the group assignment because is the presentation Wednesday online? Yes, it's online. It's via Zoom. Um, so there's no uh, there's no offline uh, meeting. And one person at least has this or sound on. So no, we're not saying anything currently, but just so you know. Um, okay. So why does an organization formulate a strategy? Well, of course, because an organization wants to know what to do. Um, but an organization formulates a strategy and determines what to do because they, an organization live in an environment. An organization has to deal with a lot of stakeholders and a lot of different forces. And these, um, the environment and also the internal environment of an organization changes. So if you don't formulate a strategy, but only focus on your, what you are doing as an organization all the time, then you run the risk of missing things that happen internally or externally. Um, so once every while as an organization, you have to think about all your stakeholders, internal and external, and think about what they, um, think about changes in the, um, um, in the environment. And if these changes in the environment are so, strong uh, that you think that you need to take action that's when you formulate a, uh, a strategy around it so you have many stakeholders you have internal stakeholders you have the employees your owners your board of direction directors and there can be changes in any of those um, uh, stakeholders and you have a lot of external stakeholders well, you have um, concrete stakeholders like unions suppliers competitors the media interest groups etc um, who all may have several um, several uh, needs and demands um, and you have to take those into account so you have to kind of try to find out what your competitors are doing you have to find out if uh, customer needs change you have to take into account uh, unions and uh, organizations that your employees are a member of in general and if any of those things are bound to change then you may formulate a strategy around that and then you of course also have the wider environment uh, which we'll uh, get to in a moment which also can cause you to change as an organization, which also can lead you to formulate a strategy. Um, so here we get to what exactly is a strategy and how is it different from a mission and a vision. So if you think of an organization, um, well, Maybe it's just fun to ask first. C can you tell me what the main purpose of an organization is? So if you think of the organization as an entity, what is it that the, that an organization wants most? Um, so just type it in the chat. Money, profit, to make money. Yeah, money. Anything else besides money? You're right when Republicans are. You are. No, just kidding. Um, to sell as much products as possible. Yeah, well, that's a very important reason and it's one of the most important reasons of a, 
organization to be. It's, um, but it's not always about making money. So organizations are also governmental organizations or profit organizations. Um, and they don't specifically want to make well, they make, want to make money, but they not specifically want to make a product. So indeed, an organization wants to strive towards their mission statements and wants to accomplish overall goals. But actually, some people say that the thing that an organization wants most is to keep existing. Um, so an organization doesn't want to end. Um, so, and in order to do that, you need to create money, profit, value, um, achieve your goals. Um, but some people say the one thing that an organization wants most is to keep existing. Um, and in order to do so, they, they need things like money and, and profit in order to pay uh, their expenses. Um, but they also need to know why they should be there in the first place. You know, it's like an existential crisis. Um, so, and therefore, indeed, they have a, um, a mission statement and they try to, to reach their overall mission and vision. And it's kind of human-like. So as a human, we also have kind of certain goals and things you want to accomplish. And we may realize sometimes that we will never completely achieve them, but it's something we strive towards to. Um, and that's basically also what an organization does. So they want to keep existing. They want to have a reason for being. The reason for being is a mission and vision. And in order to reach that, they um, set strategic objectives. And those can be making money, making profit, and oftentimes it is creating value, making money, making profit, making a profit. Um, but that all relates to the mission and vision statement of the organization. So indeed, to achieve the core values, uh, mission statement is our and chief mission statement is important. So okay, so what what is what? So what is a mission statement? Um, first, I must add that. But in the literature, they say that they give specific definitions of a mission and a vision, but there is hardly any organization who specifically says our mission is, our vision is. Maybe sometimes they do, but often it's just one, um, uh, like one or two lines that define what the, organ what the mission, both the mission and the vision of an organization. But a mission is, um, yeah, raison d'être. So it's a reason for being. Um, it's a statement what the business wants to achieve and what and it's a general statement what business it is in. Um, and a vision is kind of an image of a future direction. So it's derived from the mission and it's input for strategy. So what do we want to achieve in the long term, or in the very long term? And I, maybe a bit of a strange comparison, but I sometimes compare it to when you have to write a paper. So because that's what I do as a scientist. Um, so in the always in the first paragraph of a paper, you um, argue your mission. So, so it's about, okay, what business are you in? So like in the first sentence of a paper, you say something about, for example, I say something about uh, social media influencers are uh, becoming more and more important as a marketing instrument, something like that. And that says, that already gives the business that I'm in. Um, and then I continue my paper and then at a certain point I say what is missing and what I want to achieve. And that's basically the vision of what I, what I want to achieve the, um, in the paper. Uh, so can we describe the vision as the role in society the company wants to achieve? Uh, yes, yes, I think that's a pretty good definition of, uh, of a vision, yeah. So in a role in a society, society can be any can can be you know make make as much money as we want, um, but it can also be um, you know um, 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 making sure that everyone's clothes are as clean as possible, or uh, basically anything that you can come up with can be a mission slash vision. So what a company wants to achieve, but in as we shall see on the next slides, oftentimes the mission and vision are intertwined. But mission is basically, okay, this is the business we're in. Um, vision is, this is what we want hope to achieve um, and in the long term. So when you need the mission and vision in order to think about your strategy, then you need your strategy in order to think about 
um, your goals uh, and your specific objectives. So that's why a mission statement is important. Um, so a mission and vision statement says, okay, this is a business bring this one for us to achieve. Based on that and based on the analysis of the environment, you say, okay, this is my strategy for the coming years. And based on your strategy for the coming years, you can formulate specific goals. And those goals can be very specific, like, okay, we want to achieve a 20% increase in customer satisfaction over the next year, something like that. And a goal which is formulated, because it's called SMART, so measurable, et cetera. Um, so then let's think about um, an organization and let's see if we can come up with, okay, what would a mission for that organization be? Um, so can anyone, so uh, maybe we can start with Apple. If, if you have the slides, it's on the next slides, my slide, but it wouldn't be really fair. Um, so does anyone have an idea about what, um, what the mission and vision of Apple is. I sure hope that you're typing. Yeah, to create products that look beautiful and are easy to use. <laughs> we need to build a wall. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Also change the name and don't have say Trump. <laughs> I think to build a wall is more a strategic objective than a strategy um, or a strategic objective than a mission. To provide the best tax services. 486. Oh that's my that's my the, I'm too old for that. <laughs> Yeah, so delivering the best software, let me. Oh. Remy, you, you now understand that you will have to explain to me what 486 means. Um, so, so if you look at what Apple does, you can see that they're quite consistent in what they want to achieve. So, um, because many of you say, for well, they want to um, um, develop user friendly technology. Uh, so during technology and software, um, uh, they want to um, uh, have a, a large customer base, uh, want to be the best in product design uh, and innovation. And that's basically what, indeed, what Apple does. So it's this, so it's to bring the best user experience to its customers, to its innovative hardware, software, and services. Um, And that's, the, I, I think that's a very good way for Apple um, 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 to go. Um, so they've, they've always, ever since they and their existence, focused on a good user experience. So especially their focus on design is um, a principal choice of them. So they will never focus on the, on the, on the, the, the cheapest um, and, and uh, give up on certain design aspects. Um, and they want to focus on things that are innovative and in hardware, software, and services. So they're not going to make innovative peanut butter or something like that. They will remain within hardware, software, services. Uh, so in the computer industry. Um, so this, this kind of leads everything they want to do. And based on this, they can derive their specific strategic objective. So, um, for example, like 20 years ago, um, Apple focused more on um, uh, designers and innovators, so they focused more on people like in the design and media industry. Um, and later on, they kind of changed their strategy a lot and focused more on mass market targeting. Um, so they come up with specific strategic objectives, but um, and given in by what customers want, given in by changes in technology, etc., but always focused on their mission and vision. So I have another example. This is from uh, Aho Delhaize, so the owner of Albert Heijn and Delhaize, uh, and much more. Um, and I think this is quite interesting because this 
it gives an overview of not only their mission and vision, but also how you can translate that not only into a strat strategic objectives for an innovation and towards the customer, but also towards like your internal values, um, basically your corporate culture, which we shall uh, discuss next week. Um, lean together, it's kind of hollow, but eat well, save time, live better, um, is their mission and vision statement. So eat well, save time, live better. Okay, they're in the fast moving consumer goods, pretty clear. Um, and they want to focus on healthy food, making food easy, accessible. So if you look at all the time right now, it's more about food that's easy to, to grab and to cook instead of basic ingredients and live better, also kind of clear as well. Um, and I translated that into um, promise for customers. So what, so what are our strategic goals? A better place to shop, better place to work, better neighbor. Well, it should not be a strategic objective yet, but it is, I think, still part of their mission. Um, they translated that into values for their internal organization, courage, integrity, teamwork, care, humor. Um, although those not one-on-one -on -one relate to their mission and vision, but they um, uh, translate that um, uh, into internal uh, uh, internal policies, which I think is also quite interesting. And I'll tell, tell more about that next week when we talk about culture. Um, so you see that mission and vision guides a lot of organizations. So uh, let's see, is the mission and vision also the motto of lots of companies? I mean, that specific mission or vision? Yeah, one, um, but what you often see is that they're quite similar. Um, so for example, if you look at the um, strategic plans of um, Dutch universities, they all focus on the same. So they all have created strategies for the coming years and they all say, uh, we want to be um, at the front of innovative research. Um, we want to offer high quality teaching. Um, we want to be in the middle of society. And um, so they all have basically have kind of similar goals, but how they, similar strategic objectives, but how they translate that into specific goals and objectives in terms of project is different. But it's not necessarily that organizations have to be like really creative in formulating mission and vision. Yeah, eat well, save time, live better is the, uh, is the purpose, is the mission, condition of uh, Uh For the Apple slide, why is the statement a strategy? Uh, isn't that a statement of what? No, it's not a strategy. Sorry, did I say that? No, it's the mission and vision. Um, so for Apple, this is the mission and vision statement uh, to bring in the best user experience. And I don't know Apple specific um, uh, strategy, but it's more concrete than, uh, than this. So finally, to make it maybe even more clear, um, let's do Google. Google's mission and vision is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, and to provide access to the world's information in one click. Um, so, so that's their mission and vision, and you see this is something that they will never fully accomplish, um, that, because it's impossible. But it's a good thing for them to strive, strive through to a good thing to strive to. Um, it also, I think this is a, a good example because it, it also is a good example of the definition not being too narrow. So Google's definition is not making the best online search engine um, because that would be too narrow because then you would only focus on creating the search engine and would forget everything that you could also do with um, the technology you have. So they say, we want to organize the world's information, make it work universally accessible and useful. And within that definition also falls Google Maps, within that definition also falls um, gathering people's information and make it universally accessible to marketeers. Um, so it's a mission statement that kind of encompasses what they, uh, what they do and gives enough room uh, for other projects. And if you kind of see what the specific strategies they have focused on um, in the past years and are still focusing on. It's 
um, focusing on ha making health information accessible, focusing on artificial intelligence and augmented reality techniques such as Google Lens, Google Voice, um, and um, uh, the smart assistants you have. Uh, focus, the focus on advertising and uh, creating advertising for um, uh, you know, creating dark groups for, for advertising, making more information for advertisers. So basically, this all their strategies for the coming years all fit nicely within their mission and vision. So it really guides who they are. Uh, there was one question I missed, I think. Could those values also be used to attract customers via psychographics um, as in market segmentations? Um, I think it kind of depends on your organization. I think it I think it does to a large extent. So um, I would say that, that Little and Aldi would not have lived better um, in their uh, mission statement. Um, so they'll probably have uh, affordable um, affordable produce or something like that in, uh, in their mission statement. So that indeed guides their target groups. It doesn't necessarily have to be the case because when you have brands that could focus on um, targeting everyone. I think Unilever, for example, is, is such a huge company that they, they I don't think they have a specific um, psychographic or demographic in mind. Um, but Al Del has, uh, I think, with his mission statement, uh, um, specifically targets the uh, upper uh, architects. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I am not, so we've, uh, we've already discussed, I wanted to take this as a case, but maybe next time else I'm continue to run behind. Um, so let's do that if we have time available. Um, so mission and vision statement, who we are, who we want to become, um, something you can use for your stakeholders. Uh, so if you want to get, uh, to make money, if you want to explain to our uh, important people like banks who we are, it's your mission and vision statement. Strategy is how we will achieve our vision, uh, usually in you know, like a five to ten year at max term. Um, goals and objectives, how we gauge our degree of success, um, is uh, really specific, okay, uh, based on our strategy, we want to achieve uh, this increase in sales. Uh, these new innovations, bring these new innovations to market, etc. So goals and objectives are specific. Okay, then why is this all useful for innovation and information technology? Because if you take this further, these of course also determine um, the projects you will be working on. So based on your strategy and goals and objectives, you can formulate an IT and innovation strategy. You can specifically say, okay, if we want to, for example, um, be able to produce our products uh, cheaper, maybe we can invest in a new information technology system that makes this um, achievable. Um, if we want to focus on uh, creating a new product in the coming years uh, for a new demographic or psychographic, okay, then focus on innovation, uh, focus on this specific innovation is what we want to do in the coming year. So we want to focus on augmented reality, whatever. Um, so goals and objectives um, give input for your um, specific strategies regarding information technology innovations, and those lead to specific projects and goals for specific innovations and um, information technology products. So there's basically like a whole process going on from who we are as an organization right to specific innovations you're working on. And that's basically what's in, in the book by, uh, um, the book chapter by uh, Boki, I think. Uh, yeah, Boki, for this, um, for this lecture, this is what they try to explain with this way more complicated picture, but I try to explain there is an interaction between the business strategy and the information system IT strategy. And I think this is a simpler representation. Okay. Um, finally, it's important to realize that um, this is an ideal situation. Um, so you have your mission and vision, 
you are thinking about what will strategy be in the coming years. Based on that, you set goals and objectives. You define certain projects you will be working on, certain innovations that may be relevant for you, and those you try to bring to market with an associated business model. Um, but it doesn't always work that way. Oftentimes, you see that um, it's far more chaotic. Um, so you have your intended strategy. So the arrow at the uh, top, the big arrow, is is, is based on your um, uh, on your mission and vision and your strategy, etc. And that re results in the things that you do as an organization. But of course, you also have emergent strategies. And that means, okay, we now see something in our immediate surroundings that we need to pay attention to now. Um, so you sometimes see that things happen in this environment of an organization that affect um, what an organization is doing right now, and in turn, they have to change their strategy. And we'll see that on the next slide. So yeah, an information system and information technology, I, I'm sorry to confuse you with the, um, um, with the constructs now. Uh, we'll explain them in a detail in a few lectures. Um, information technology is technology, hardware, software, etc. Information system is basically what you do with information technology. So what information flows through information technology and together the technology and what people do with the technology is an information system. Um, but that basically only comes relevant, becomes relevant in uh, uh, lecture number eight. Okay, so um, that was like a very, very short introduction. Uh, of course, you know, if you, uh, if you study business administration, you have complete courses in business strategy and uh, 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 setting strategic goals. But this was a very short introduction on what a strategy is and how is it derived from mission and vision and why is it useful. So whatever it is useful for your innovation and IT strategy. So, so what is an innovation in IT strategy? Here's the word again, information technology and information system. For now, you can forget. You can just replace it with innovation or technology or whatever. Um, but an information technology and information system or innovation strategy is a portfolio of the systems or innovations you want to implement that are aligned with um, your business strategy, and that may help you become better than your competitors, because that's not always, but oftentimes why you do it. So you want to be able to produce uh, stuff in a cheap profession, and you want to be able to um, uh, offer a service that's better than your competitors. Um, and in order to do so, so in, so in order to, you know, to remain into existence, to attain, attain your strategic goals, you may want to invest in innovation or in information technology that may help you achieve that. So a very simple example would be like an information technology that allows you to um, optimize your internal processes more efficiently. So it's easier for information and for your, the products you make to flow through the organization. And if that happens faster and um, more efficient, then um, you'll be able to produce your stuff more cheaply and that will give you an advantage. Um, so basically based on your strategy you can think of okay what in what innovations do we want to focus on technology technology innovations or other innovations. Um, but like I said in this slide it's not always that's not always the case it does not always work that way it's sometimes the other way around. Um, and that is what called strategic alignment. And strategic alignment means that you um, um, think about the relation between technology and innovation and your organization strategy. Um, and then there are three options. So, um, well, let me start with this one. So, on the one hand, you have strategic alignment. And that means that you, okay, um, 
I have a mission and vision as an organization. We formulate certain strategies as an organization, and then we implement those strategies and we can use innovations or information technology for to attain, sorry, to attain those specific strategic objectives. Um, so for example, if HEMA or any other organization says, okay, um, in the coming years, we want to focus on increasing customer satisfaction. Um, how can we do that? Um, so we want to be uh, able to respond quicker to customer questions. We want to be able to handle our after sales uh, in a more efficient and customer friendly way. How could we do that? And then suddenly HEMA realizes, ah, maybe we can invest in um, uh, Facebook. So we can update our Facebook page. We can um, uh, have uh, people uh, available around the clock 24 seven who are um, online and who can answer questions via Facebook or Facebook Messenger, or to be WhatsApp or other technologies. Um, so we can use that technology, we can use that innovation in order to obtain our goals. So this is alignment. So HEMA has a strategy, they want to increase customer satisfaction, and in order to do so, they look around and they say, ah, okay, we can use this innovation, Facebook is not really an innovation anymore, and we can use this technology um, in order to reach those objectives and successfully fulfill our strategy. So that's alignment. But sometimes you have something which is called business impact strategy. And that means that there is an innovation or a technology that forces you to um, switch strategy as an organization. So, for example, the reason that many newspapers have um, gone online or partly online, or you can read them all via tablet, um, is not given in because they realized that that was a possibility, but because suddenly people got more and more tablets. Um, so they noticed uh, there is an innovation going on in the market where we see that people have tablets available and they watch new.nl um, uh, and other new sites on their tablet. We should do something with that because if we don't, we're gonna, yeah. We'll be, we'll be bankrupt, we're going to cease existing. Um, so in this case, there is a, a technology incentive. So there is actually an innovation which forces an organization to change their strategy. Um, so in this case, it's the other way around. So in this case, you see that there is a technology or innovation and you change your strategy accordingly. So in this case, it's just an example. The false crowd observes, okay, people are reading the news, are uh, able to read the newspapers online because more and more people have tablets. We should focus on investing uh, in that and making our newspaper available online. So that's a business impact strategy. So business aligning, you have general statistic objectives and they give rise to um, information system strategy so specific investments and attention to specific innovations and technologies business impact is that you have information systems opportunities so you have technologies and innovations that you observe and then you think okay we need to do something with that as an organization so you change your strategic objectives as a result of technology um, and of course the truth, as always, is somewhere in the middle. So there is often an interaction going on between um, the technology and the strategy. So, for example, I don't know if you remember, but Netflix turned out as a DVD rental company. Um, so when Netflix just started, you could rent DVDs via Netflix. So they were a kind of blockbuster video or video land, as we used to, used to have. In, uh, as, as uh, brick and mortar sh stores. Um, but then online. So you just rented the DVD. The DVD got sent to you via post, um, you know, old fashioned mail. Um, you could watch it and then you returned it. Um, so it was always a strategy to offer um, uh, entertainment um, via new technologies. 
But then Netflix realized, hey, we see that mo many more people now have a fast internet connection. Uh, we see that cloud service become more and more cheaper. Um, so we observe these technologies, so high-speed internet access and uh, bandwidth availability and storage availability. So we are going to change our strategy and are going to offer streaming a streaming service. So in the case of Netflix, it's really a, um, a, an in-between uh, uh, strategy. So on the one hand, spurred by what they always wanted to do. On the other hand, the uh, shift, the rapid shift of Netflix to work a streaming service is really given in by uh, changes in technology and technology use. I think that's pretty clear. Okay, then in the next part of the lecture, uh, we're going through um, some, or basically many, of the strategic tools you can use as an organization to, um, well, to do multiple things. You can use strategic tools to um, think about your strategic strategies for the coming years, to think about your strategic objectives. Um, you can use strategic tools to determine if you want to, as an organization, enter a new market, for example, um, which is also part of your strategy. Um, you can also use these strategic tools in your business plan or in your analysis of, of if an innovation is worthwhile. Um, so strategic tools are tools that you use, well, not physical tools, but you know, uh, 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 basically uh, uh, um, pen and paper tools that you use to determine your overall strategy or determine specific parts of your strategy. So determine the usefulness of an innovation, uh, determine um, a product that you want to develop, etc. And last week when we talked about the business models, uh, we already uh, discussed, or at least uh, I've shown a couple of these tools. Um, and there are like many, so I have a book at the university, unfortunately, but it's called the management model book. And in there, are, I think like 50 um, tools that managers can use to do a certain thing, you know, to develop a strategy, to think about customer uh, satisfaction, to think about employee commitment. So you have many, many, many of these management tools available. But here we focus on, um, we focus on these specific tools that are used for um, to determine an organization strategy uh, and to determine the usefulness of information technologies or innovations. Most of them are uh, general strategic tools. Uh, so they're tools that organizations in general use to determine how they're doing. Um, Two of them, McFarland's strategic grid and information flow modeling, are um, sp more specific to um, information technology innovation, uh, related to information technology innovation. And I already can tell you that I will probably not make it through the whole information flow modeling uh, in this lecture. Um, but fortunately, next week, uh, fortunately, I prepared next week's slide ahead of time, so we have more time next week. But then again, I said that um, in the previous lectures as well. Um, yeah, so within all the strategic tools, you have um, tools which are more focused on a macro level, so like a bird's eye perspective on the uh, entire environment of an organization. Um, and you have tools that are more micro or no, well, meso oriented, which focus on a specific uh, industry. Um, and you have tools that are more micro that focus on your specific organization. Um, so a pestle analysis, as it's called now, it used to be called pest analysis, but now they added the E and L, um, is really a macro level perspective of the complete surroundings of the organization. Um, while a, a SWOT analysis is really focused on your own organization. Uh, explain macro and micro levels. You know what macro and micro is, I hope. Okay. Um, so, um, ma macro means um, 
so let me start by saying there's no there's no clear cut distinction between macro and micro level but macro means um um, that you look not only at your own organization or the own industry you're in, so you do not uh, directly look at what am I doing okay as an organization uh, and what are my immediate competitors doing. Um, but macro means okay, we're gonna uh, we're gonna uh, take it a level up or two, and we're gonna focus on okay, what what happens in wider society. So if we look at um, um, other countries if we look at the legal framework in the countries you are working in uh, if we look at the things as wide and far-ranging as climate change um, how would that affect our organization in the shorter and longer term so that's the macro perspective so looking at it from uh, really a bird's eye view from the, from the top while micro is really focused on your organization and the immediate surroundings Clear. Okay, so I'm not going to pay that much attention to uh, to all of them. For example, a SWOT analysis, um, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threats is quite self-explanatory, and we'll explain a bit more about some others. So again, why are they useful? Well, they're useful because um, when you develop an innovation strategy. So when you um, think of an innovation, when you plan, a, when you write a business model around innovation, um, you have to match the innovation with the organization strategy. So you have to, so you have to um, think about okay, what is my organization doing now? What what are they good in? What are the competitors doing? Um, so in order to match the innovations you're working on with your organization, um, or in order to develop new innovations. Um, these tools are useful. You can do use these tools to kind of find out what innovations are useful for you, what innovations are we should be working on now. And the same goes exactly for information technology, because information technology, you know, um, investments in innovation technology is basically always an innovation as well. So it's always implementing new technology um, or upgrading technology in you know, order to be able to work better. Um, and you can also build a business model around uh, an information technology. So basically, information technology functions basically the same level as an innovation. Um, so you can also use these tools to, to match information technology with your organization strategy to determine what you should be, so in order to determine what you should be investing in. Okay. So there are a bunch of these tools. I suggest I do Pestle now, and then we take a short break, and then we continue with Fortress Flight Forces. Because I'm gonna be very short in the Pestle analysis. So there is a lot on this slide. Um, but I just nick this image from uh, Google Image Search. Um, it basically is to show you that Pestle stands for Political, Economic, Societal, Technological, Environmental, and Legal aspects of the environment. Um, it could well be that if you're in your pre-master now, that you have already had pestle analysis in the previous course, and that the E and the L or the S, I think, mean something different to you. Um, but I always forget what the other options are. Um, yeah, I'm gonna explain. Um, So, um, you, you, uh, uh, which questions shall I answer first? Yeah, what is, what is, yeah, it's, yeah, it's the same as that step, D step, the step. Um, yeah, it's the same. Um, so there are different, uh, there are different words for it. Um, yeah, ah, oh, stop. <laughs> okay, that, um, okay, I'll I'll answer them in order. So the difference between political and legal is that um, legal is really the law aspect. So are there any laws? So for example, if you um, as an organization want to do something in a new country, what are the specific laws or regulations in that country? Um, 
okay, I have an organization that sells booze. Um, maybe I should check into the uh, laws um, um, in um, uh, other countries. So maybe if I want to uh, expand to uh, Saudi Arabia, I need to take into account the legal and I think also the political and societal aspects. Um, so it's a legal aspect. So what is happening legally? Um, and not only such a silly example as I just uh, gave, but also is there something happening with copyright law? So, you know, the AVG or GDPR is part of the legal environment. Um, political is more, not really legal, but what happens politically. So who is in charge? Um, is the country or um, region heading into a more conservative or liberal, di liberal direction? Um, are there any things going on with, uh, are there any trade wars between countries? Um, is there unionization um, happening uh, now? So are employees organizing uh, or not? Um, those are political things. Okay, that's one. Uh, then maybe what does it stand for? P, political, E, economic, S, societal, T, technolo technology, innovation, E, environmental, L, legal. Um, so how in depth do you have to go in this into in the business plan? Not in depth at all. So only mention those specific factors that you think may affect successful adoption of your innovation. So if your innovation has nothing to do with any environmental things, don't mention the E of environmental at all. Um, if you don't expect any legal issues, don't mention the L at all. But if you think, okay, this um, um, societal aspect is interesting, so if your innovation focuses on uh, the elderly, then an important Point to mention is that uh, here in Europe, um, the population becomes much is becoming much and much older. So an innovation specifically focuses on an elderly population is probably something that is worthwhile. Um, and that's the thing you only mentioned. So don't go searching for factors in all these in all the six um, uh, so in in all the six different uh, uh, factors. Uh, now let me scroll down. Uh, what are the other two? Yeah, uh, political, economic, societal, technological, environmental, legal. Um, how do you go about finding the specific data for all these points? Is web searching up? Do you need other sources as well? Well, usually um, now web searching is enough. Um, but usually when you're an organization, you of course you have your um, legal department. Um, you have your IT and research and development department who are aware of probably technological innovations. Um, you have your economists in your organization. Um, you can also hire consultants from the outside. You know, you have many strategy consultants um, who help you with these kind of analysis. Um, and of course, web searching also helps. Um, and, and of course, you know, keeping up with the news. Um, yeah, absolutely. So like the US election influencer, that's pretty important. You know what happens? So now that Trump wants to appoint a new judge who is conservative, that will probably have a huge impact on many policy issues in the coming decades in the US. So for example, um, if you want to invest in an abortion clinic, um, that's probably not wise to do uh, right now in the US. Um, so those are really political uh, issues that really can affect your organization to a huge extent. Um, do we have to use a lot of sources? I don't think so. I think many of the uh, questions are in the business plan are based on your um, on your own innovation. Um, and um, if you use, so of course, if you refer to uh, um, something you found in the literature, um, or uh, a reference in um, uh, a reference from the course literature you refer to that that should be in your reference list um, and indeed I also think that you um, 
we'll have to find many non-academic sources for a best analysis and in general for your business plan as a whole. Because in academia, of course, we lack a couple of years behind uh, uh, most of the time. So you do need non-academic sources to, to uh, be um, uh, up with the times um, with all the, uh, for example, with the best analysis. So that would probably influence your grade <laughs> positively. Um, yeah, so statistical analysis is okay. Like in general, when you're writing a research paper, um, so when you're writing an introduction of a paper for anything, so also for your thesis, it's okay to refer to non-academic sources. Um, so not in your theoretical argumentation and in your development of your research question, but in general, if you write a thesis or a paper, whatever, and you want to explain that something becomes more popular, it's pretty okay to use non-academic sources. Um, okay, so that's a pastel analysis. I suggest that we have a short break. So I'm going to get a cup of coffee, so let's say five minutes or so, and then we continue with uh, water. Then I, I also have time to read the question. I'll, I'll get back to it once I get my uh, coffee. I don't need a cup of coffee. I don't need a cup of tea. I'm living in my moment. You don't know what I mean. Uh, uh, no, do not. Uh oh. Do, oh, oh no. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, bitch. I know. I know. Uh, uh. I know. I know.
Okay, I'm going to get back to the lecture, uh, but just one second. Okay, um, let me show you uh, the um, uh, business plan instructions. Um, so, um, in the, the presentation of this Thursday, you have to present your innovation and uh, explain why your innovation is a success in short. Uh, that means that you have to uh, that you explain parts A through C of the um, business plan. So the innovation, uh, the innovation and its characteristics, the innovation, the user, and the market. So you see A, B, C, and all these parts um, up to here are part of your um, uh, are part of your in a, uh, presentation this um, the week. Um, so. Um, and again, if you haven't really thought your revenue model through or um, if, if um, things are still a bit unclear, um, try to present them anyway because it's the moment that you get feedback. Um, so I don't think this will all fit on one slide. So you don't easily go. No, you don't get a grade for the presentation. Um, so you can mess it up all you like, but you get a grade for the business plan and, and you get feedback on the presentation which you use for the business plan. So no grade. Um, so it's so the presentation is purely as a means to help to to uh, get feedback from uh, us, the teachers, and from um, uh, yourself, um, from the other students. What also always helps, um, and what I'm, I'm going to point that out in the announcement as well, um, but what I would like you to do um, is um, um, also give feedback in the chat to um, uh, your fellow students. And um, think, of your, think of the group presenting as a group who is pitching their ID to you, and think of you as a bank or a board of directors um, trying to find out if the innovation is a good idea. Um, so do not give feedback in like a nice presentation or something like that, but give feedback in terms of um, why would people want to adopt this presentation in the first place, because and then an explanation. Or um, um, I, I don't believe you will be able to make money with this presentation because, um, or some more positive feedback. Because those are the things that you need to think about in your business plan. So you can help your fellow students by giving that kind of feedback so that they're forced to think about you know, the business aspects of it. Yeah, yeah, you have to present for your other groups as well. So uh, there, are, are, there are 30 uh, people uh, in the uh, work group session. Um, so, and each group presents it, um, uh, Presents the uh, presents it to your own uh, to, to the to the complete work group session. So you have uh, there are five people in the group. So there are twenty five people who uh, um, watch your presentation and give feedback. Yeah, I thought it was this was pretty clear. So uh, so but you do uh, yeah you do present for other groups as well. Yeah. So your fellow students are the 30 students in the work group session. So it's not the 150 students that I'm talking to uh, now. Or, okay, 98. Okay, and uh, back to the uh, presentation. I started out with 150 people uh, a couple of weeks ago, and now I have nine, uh, close to 100 left. So, Sorry, uh, I'll, maybe I should do a little dance or something like that. So I hope you're still interested in the uh, in the lectures. Um, 
and maybe there are still even groups that are that all will be missing uh, this this week because they quit the course. Well, I never know. Um, so back to the presentation. So we discussed pastel. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I know. <laughs> I, I only feel comfortable dancing when, when I have a lot to drink. I've had a lot to drink, like really a lot. And then when it's really, really crowded, so I don't, uh, so I feel like never, no one sees me. I, I do have some, I do have um, some subliminal influence uh, for you. Don't know if you've noticed if you can see me. I, I have a book um, with Alexander the Great uh, here. I hope it will help uh, will help my uh, student my student evaluation. <laughs> so if I still have 100 students at the end, then maybe I'll, I'm going to dance like no one's watching. Well, the most on a more serious note, um, in my master course um, uh, uh, last Thursday in the uh, workgroup sessions, we did indeed discuss what makes it more easy and more difficult to uh, 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 when you communicate online. So we had a discussion in the workgroup session uh, uh, about, okay, what is the advantage of Zoom? What's the disadvantage? And many people indeed indicate, okay, it's the fact, also the fact that you can see yourself because I can now see myself on screen on this, this screen. And on that screen, I see the presentation. Um, and seeing yourself creates self-awareness, creates awareness of what you're doing. And that private self-awareness has a huge effect on your ability to communicate with others because it, you know, it makes you aware. Um, so, so if I start to dance, I can see myself dancing and that will lead to you know, all kinds of very negative consequences. And in fact, private self-awareness is really something that has been studied a lot in terms of computer-mediated communication. Um, okay. If you're interested in that, you uh, should take my master course, uh, Social Media at Work, uh, uh, next year. Um, okay, back to the business aspect. Uh, so the second tool is Porter's Five Forces. Um, and oh, there's the answer. Um, Porter's Five Force is one of the most well-known tools uh, available to assess the surroundings of your organization. So this can be seen as a more micro-level uh, tool uh, because it's focused on, okay, what am I doing as an organization and what are the um, threats, uh, the forces, immediate forces surrounding it. Um, so this, of course, is a useful tool for your innovation as well. So um, I have come up with an idea. Um, what are my competitors doing? Um, what is the bargaining power of suppliers, of customers, etc.? Um, so this is a very useful tool for strategy or for strategy in general or specific innovations or products that you want to bring to market. So okay, what is a um, five forces analysis and what are these five forces? So, um, Let's do the example of peanut butter um, that I uh, that was briefly on the previous slide. So I want to introduce, so you have the peanut butter shop, the Pindakaas Winkelman, and they have um, uh, several outlets, I think, in, uh, in the Netherlands now. And you can buy all sorts of fancy, fancy very expensive peanut butter. Um, and it's all, you know, biological and, uh, and uh, you know, environmental stuff. Um, so if you have a product like this, you can do an five forces analysis to see what any threats or opportunities are in the environment. So you can start out with rivalry among existing competitors. So you can think about who are my existing competitors you know, who also made high-end biological peanut butter and are they a threat to me or can we coexist in the market? So for example, uh, many supermarkets are selling um, uh, biological peanut butter, um, environmental friendly made peanut butter, um, you have many um, um, uh, biological supermarkets that sell those kind of stuff. Um, so you have some rivalry among existing competitors, but you can think, okay, there is no store specifically for peanut butter, so maybe this is a niche we can um, crawl into um, without that much to fear from existing competitors. 
So that's rightfully among your existing competitors. So if you make televisions, other uh, companies who make televisions are your existing competitors. That's one. Threat of substitutes are um, other things that people can buy that fulfill the same need as your product. So again, if I sell peanut butter, um, a substitute may be cheap mass-produced peanut butter or maybe hagelslag. Um, or some other sweet uh, thing to put on your bread. Um, so those are substitutes. So, okay, I make eco-friendly peanut butter, a substitute maybe regular supermarket peanut butter. Um, and that's a threat of a substitute. How many people are willing to buy a substitute and how many, and, uh, consecutively, how many people would be willing to invest a bit more in my produce product? So, that's substitutes. Um, so if you make televisions, a substitute can be, okay, how many people visit movies in a movie theater? Well, currently none, um, but um, those may be substitutes. Uh, how many people read books? Those things. Yeah, for the business plan, I, I think you can just, you know, argue it like logically. So um, um, just by thinking about it. Uh, but if you have any sources um, um, or if, you know, you Google your innovation or you Google existing products and you come up with sources, that would be okay. But it's enough to think about it. So those, that is a threat of substitutes. Um, the threat of new entrants, that's also pretty easy. Threat of new entrants is other people who may enter the same market. So other, are there, are there any other companies who start their own line of eco-friendly peanut butter? Um, I'll come to that later on. Um, so that's new entrants. The bargaining power of suppliers is how much power your suppliers have to influence you. So for example, if you, um, are dependent on one single supplier, or if you make um, a small range of products and you rely on specific raw materials for that, your suppliers have a lot of power. So for example, if I make things out of iron, um, I only have a few suppliers in, the, in Europe to go to. I can go to Tata Steel um, and maybe some in England and Germany, but that's it. So if the price of raw steel rises, I have to pay more. Um, so they have a huge power and they have lots of power over me um, because no, no, there are not many people I can turn to. Um, on the other hand, there are um, other products, well, I can't, can't even remember an example, but there are products for, products for which there are a lot of different suppliers and you can easily switch suppliers. Um, so that's the bargaining power of suppliers. Now, in case of an app, if you develop an app, you don't have that many suppliers. Um, maybe, you know, if you hire or outsource the design uh, or you hire um, um, software coders, those maybe can be seen as suppliers and they can have power over you. So I think in that case, you can see developers as a kind of suppliers to, and to, because they provide the intellectual capital that goes into developing your app. Um, but it's not, so it's not, so, um, you always have to take into account these five forces, but it's perfectly okay for you to say, okay, this force does not play a huge role in my, um, in my business plan because I'm going to develop it from the ground up in-house so I have no suppliers. Um, and of course, but there we get into uh, the confusing situation with apps is that of course, the, the platform, the App Store, supplies you the platform for you to sell your product on. On the other hand, it's also a kind of a buyer. So it's a bit difficult for that, but we, we get to that when we talk about virtual organizations. Um, but for now, you don't, so you don't make something concrete, so suppliers play less of a role. Finally, buyers, what is their bargaining powers? Um, so if you are a specific business to business company, maybe you only have a handful of clients um, and those can have large power. So if one of them quits, you're out of, you're out of work. 
Um, so it also depends on the business you're in if your buyers have a lot of power. So if you make a mass product and one customer doesn't buy your product anymore, yeah, who cares? You know, it's just one customer out of millions. Um, so it's not that bad. Unless they start to unionize or if they post it on Facebook and it becomes, uh, it goes viral. Um, so what, so buyers can also have a lot of power uh, over you. Hmm. So, um, yeah, so buyers have a lot of power um, uh, over uh, e-commerce companies and in general in, uh, in, in clothing uh, companies as well, buyers have a lot of power, so they have a lot of um, uh, options. Um, uh, to go through, to go to. Um, so, and that's the reason why, for example, Ball.com and Amazon, they offer um, Amazon uh, Prime and uh, Ball.com, I don't know what it's called, um, so that you pay a set amount of money each year and then you get it delivered the same day. Um, because then you are less likely to order it from a uh, another company because you think okay i have already paid like 50 euros um for one day shipping so i might as well order it from amazon so that's a tool so they present it as a handy tool as an innovation but it's actually used to lock you in as a buyer so to actually um, make sure that you have less power to switch um uh, to switch where you buy uh, that product from so things like Amazon Prime um, and other services you pay for so to get easy delivery is exactly are exactly and only meant to take away your power as a buyer. Um, and that kind of nicely relates to what I was going to say next, that you can use innovation and you can use technology to counter all these competitive forces. So we can use one day delivery and having people pay a small fee in order to take away customer power. Uh, you can invest in new technology to be able to produce more cheaper. So you become more competitive um, relative to your um, existing competitors. Um, you could also simply innovate in products that are very difficult to make. So like very, very expensive, uh, or very difficult to copy so that there are not many new entrants. Uh, in the field. Um, suppliers, if you are a very large company, um, so for example, Walmart is one of the major retailers in the US. Um, so if Walmart says, well, we're not going to sell your product anymore, um, you, you can risk getting out of being out of business. So Walmart actually has the capacity to say, for, well, okay, you as a supplier have to deliver your products to me in the way that I want. So you have to use our systems, our logistics. Um, and if you say no, we just go to someone else. Um, so Walmart uses their um, logistic services. They use, they use their um, logistic technology um, in order to lock in suppliers so that suppliers have no choice but to use Walmart systems. Um, I will explain this a bit more in, 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 the, in the next lecture and I think or lecture after that. So you connect your can connect your system to your suppliers in order to lock your suppliers in and you can basically do the same with your customers. So you can lock in buyers by connecting systems to that. It's all, another example for example is that you um, for example I have a uh, HP printer I think yeah, um, it's an HP printer. Um, and they offer a subscription service so that they can automatically um, see when I run out of ink and they can automatically send me new ink as a subscription service. Um, and they do that to lock me in. So because then I can never buy it from somewhere, from somewhere else. So of course I did not take the service. Um, so you can use technology and you can use innovations to, to, uh, to kind of take away power from your buyer of suppliers and to become better, cheaper, et cetera, um, in order to take away the threat of your competitors, new entrants or substitute products. Okay, 
Um, so that's five forces. Um, the next one is uh, Porter's Generic Competitive Strategies. Um, that's a tool to find out um, where you are in an industry. It's also a micro level tool. It's to find out, okay, who do I want to be as an organization um, in my industry? Um, and it's a two by two, but on the next slide, we will see something which is pretty similar, but then I think it's a bit more easy to understand. But let's go to this. They say, for well, as an organization, you can either focus on costs or you can focus on differentiation. Costs means you focus on efficiency. Differentiation means you focus on making something that's unique. So that's one. The next thing is you can either focus on, I'm going to be industry-wide, so I'm focusing on a, I can make a, basically a mass market product, um, so for a huge amount of people, or I focus on a specific segment, um, so a specific niche of the customer, and there I provide something. Um, so for example, cost and industry-wide, is for example Aldi and Lidl. So they, they are industry wise and they focus on the entire consumer market, but they focus on low costs. So everything they do is focused on being cheaper. So that's why they just throw the boxes in the supermarket. Um, that's why it looks like shit when you go shopping there. Um, Albert Heijn, on the other hand, focuses on differentiation. You, know, you have Albert Heijn Excel, so you have luxury supermarkets. Um, with better products, uh, with lots of choice, um, so they're more, exp which makes it more expensive. Um, but they do it because their strategy is more focused on differentiation and offering a better product. Um, and one is not better than the other; it's just the what you focus on, and both can be just as profitable, of course. Um, so if you have a specific focus, um, you do basically the same, but then for a, a niche. So for example, Apple, um, again, Apple is now industry-wide differentiation. So they focus on making a better product um, across the industry, um, but not necessarily cheaper. Um, but Apple 15 years ago was really focused differentiation. So, it, so they mainly made um, products for um, uh, designers and people in the media. Um, so they shifted strategic focus. Lowest cost within an industry segment is, I, I don't know, maybe, um, maybe Dell, who focuses on, um, um, on Dell business to business, focuses on um, delivering um, uh, affordable computers for uh, uh, businesses. So that, that may be lowest cost within the industry segment. So those are four different strategies. But to be honest, I think this one, Tracy and Wiersma's value disciplines, is kind of similar, but I think easier to understand and maybe more interesting to include in your business plan. Because they say, for, well, what you can do as a, um, um, what you should choose as an organization is, okay, you should either focus on product leadership should focus on operational excellence or customer intimacy, which basically means, okay, product leadership, focus on making the best product there is, Apple, and um, you can focus on operational excellence, so being as cheap as possible, best total cost, they all Aldi, or you can focus on customer intimacy, offering the best total solution, offering the great customer service. Kind of for an example. Um, and they say, of course, of course, every organization needs to have a certain threshold, so you cannot only focus on design and do not, fo not focus on customers and operational excellence at all. So there should be a certain threshold here. Um, but everything after that is really a choice that you have to make as an organization. It gives you leadership value. So this is what you, you should have basic level of operational um, excellence, customer intimacy and product uh, differentiation or leadership. Um, but anything more, you should choose between those three. 
Um, and that's what gives you leadership value. So basically what makes you more uh, competitive. Uh, ecology awareness be a new focus in this model? I, ooh, that's a good question. Now I think it might be. So I'm trying to see, does this, is this, this could be in the end related to customer intimacy, you know, to people liking you because you have an, an eco-friendly image, but in a more, well, ethically, um, it, I think it should be uh, a focus in the model as well, so that you have a certain threshold about eco-friendly uh, production uh, production methods and distribution methods, so that it should be like different from only doing it for uh, uh, for the image. But I, I think it's more a uh, yeah, I think that's an ethical question, but I tend to say yes. Um, the difference between product leadership, yeah, I'm running a bit uh, behind, but let me do this because the, let me end with this. Um, because you're absolutely right. Um, so they say you should do everything a bit, but you cannot do everything a lot. So you should focus. But of course, it connects. So if you make a very good product, so if you differentiate your products, you will, customer intimacy will automatically be higher. But you can also say, that, okay, we are not necessarily going to invest a lot in making specific designer products, but we are, we are there for the masses, but we have a very good after-sales service. Um, so, so you can see it uh, uh, discon disconnected from each other. Only, of course, you can. So they, Tracy and Diersma say, uh, no, you need to focus, but if you look at, for example, HEMA uh, again, they basically try to do everything. You know, they try to make very creative uh, products, but still be uh, affordable. And uh, they are very careful to have a, to to remain um, to, to to remain their image the same. That's not a good sentence, but to, to keep their image the same. Um, so being like a Dutch uh, tradition. So Tracy and Beers are saying no focus, but to be honest, there are companies who are trying to do um, all of that. Little as well, they say, for, well, okay, um, we are cheap, but we also are the best in vegetables and fruit for the past five years, etc. cetera. Um, and they try to work on that image and customer intimacy as well. Um, so it's good to have a focus. So it's good to basically think, okay, are you going to be cheap? Do we want to have like, really specialized products or our customers? How important are is customer satisfaction? Um, but I think the threshold value can be larger than Tracy and Beersama um, suppose. Um, then we have a, a couple of more to go. Um, so again, I'm running late. I will really, really, really do my best of changing in next lecture. Um, it's your fault. It's because you're so interactive. <laughs> no, thank you very much for that. But I'm, I, I'm. It, it takes more time to teach online. There are more questions of you, which uh, of you is that great, that, which is great, which I really, really enjoy, but I still haven't adopted my teaching and my preparation um, to that. So that's why I'm running behind. Um, it's so frustrating that you never finish on time. Yeah. The <laughs> I, I was going to make a joke. Um, but I, I, that's, no, I cannot make that joke when we're still recording. I am very sorry that I never finished on time. Um, sorry. Um, just, yeah, you know, just give me a bad evaluation. Uh, <laughs> so I'll try to do my best now. I'm sorry. So, but still, I'm going to stop now because I have another lecture at, uh, um, I have another lecture at, um, at 11 o'clock, so I can't finish it. I'm really sorry. I'll try to do my best uh, next time. <laughs> Forgive me if I... Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm going to stop.